God bless you, everyone. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. Welcome. Um, in this particular recorded series, this is part three, which is the divinity of first fruits. In this part three, we answer some questions that were brought about from our first two episodes, so we'll be talking about that. I'll do a review. I'll answer the questions that were brought up or, or subject topics, you might call them. And then we'll talk about the divinity of first fruits. We'll also talk about what the ceremony of first fruits is all about. So let me begin. Uh, this year's first fruit celebration has been moved to October 25th, 2020, due to the pandemic that interrupted the original plans that had been put in place in April 2020. This year's celebration will more closely match the Jewish New Year Rosh Hashanah 2020 that began in the evening of Friday, September 18th. The Jewish New Year is the first of the Jewish High Holy Days specified by Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23 through 32 that occur in the early autumn of the Northern Hemisphere. The current Jewish year is AM 5780. The AM stands for Eno Mundi. That's Latin in the year of the world. The abbreviation AM, the year dating from the year of the creation in Jewish chronology based on rabbinic calculations. We will celebrate on Sunday, March 25th, 2020 at noon. The question that was asked, are tithes pre-tax or after-tax? That is, do you pay off of the gross or the net? Do you pay off of the amount before taxes or the amount based on after taxes? I'll use two scriptures to answer that question. The first one, which we talked about in a previous session, is Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. So we learned about that already, that it's 10% of a financial amount. Now we'll find out, is it, is it uh, before taxes or after taxes? And the answer to that question is in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Okay, see, the seed is like a tax that you do not see in your bank account. It's the gross of all that is produced. So that's what we're talking about. So for example, what Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30 is talking about is if you make $100, okay, and you are taxed 30%, your paycheck is a net of $70. Well, you don't tithe off the $70. The tithe is the 10% of the gross, which is the $100. The tithe is $10 because it is 10% of $100. So Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 explains the gross. Now, we have talked about offerings in our previous sessions, um, and offerings ha has a different instruction. And we get that from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, where the scripture reads, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is be above and beyond a tithe. Okay? So a tithe is the obedience to an instruction to be followed through. It shows your integrity, that you're worthy of following instruction, and you're worthy of more. Okay, that's what a tithe is. An offering, on the other hand, is given after a tithe, and it comes from a cheerful giver that shows your character. So a tithe shows your integrity, and an offering shows your character. We learn about tithes from Deuteronomy 14.22, and we learn about an offering from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. We also learn for the tithes, that Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, shows that we make a payment based on the gross, not the net. So it's the before tax amount, 
okay? At the end of the day, people can choose what they want to do. You're not going to get an invoice from the Resurrection Center. The church does not force anyone. It's a choice you make personally under God. Be of good cheer when you give a tithe and an offer. The same is first fruits, but that's a prophetic uh, offering through celebration. We're going to talk about that, okay? So first fruit offering, as I said before, is a prophetic celebration of a harvest to come. It's for financial favor and provision. It's an offering of first fruits. The Hebrew word for first fruit is bikram, and that's an important word, more important than when I first discussed it. Literally, it's translated to promise to come. The Israelites saw these first fruits as an investment in their future because it was a very prophetic offering. God told them that if they brought their first fruits to him, he would bless all that came afterwards. Okay, first fruits is a prophetic offering. Now I'm going to go over some vocabulary. So this is important as we look at some scripture. There's yield, increase, harvest, and basket. What do those mean in today's terms? Well, a yield refers to the earnings generated and put into a bank account. An increase refers to your income. A harvest refers to a bank account, and the basket refers to the wallet that you carry money. Okay, so my topic of discussion now is based on the amount of first fruits. What is it? Uh, how much do you pay? Is it a percentage like tithes? It isn't. I'll, I'll explain what it is. Let me first have a discussion about first fruits, then we'll talk about the amount. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10, the scripture says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and you shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest unto the priest. So a sheaf in agricultural times came from the initial reaping of the initial part of the harvest season. It's a bundle of grain stalks laid lengthwise and tied together after reaping, okay? First fruits is the initial outpouring of a harvest before it goes into peak season. It is to be blessed by the high priest so that the remaining part of the harvest may be abundant. Now in Proverbs chapter three, verse nine through 10, the scripture reads, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will be brimmed with new wine. So your wealth is which you possess in your harvest. That's, that's what you have. It's your yield. It's your income. The offering of the first fruits at the very beginning of the harvest season, i.e. first fruits, is like the sheaf of grain. It was a token of gratitude for what the Lord had and will do in our future. It's a prophetic offering of gratitude for future blessings within our lives. The first fruits were brought in a basket to the sanctuary and presented to the priest, who was to set the basket down before the altar. They were also to bring a lamb of the first year without a blemish, a grain offering with oil, and a drink offering of wine. The people were forbidden to eat of the crops until the first fruits were celebrated. See, it's a celebration, it's a ceremony, okay? Because it's a prophetic ceremony. Then the basket was waved, you'll see that, you know, waved in front of the altar as ministry unto the Lord to bless the remaining crop to come following the first fruit. The first fruits were harvested before the yield of the remaining crop. Now what I'm going to talk about, you, you probably hear when you see studies of the Old Testament, which is also the, the Torah, um, you'll hear phrases like, as in Jewish tradition. You hear that. This is done as in Jewish tradition. Well, the reason why the tradition stayed consistent is because it's documented, and it's in something called the Talmud, T-A-L-M-U-D, Talmud. The Talmud is the central text of rabbinic Judaism and the primary source of Jewish religious law and Jewish theology. Christians use it, the, theologians and Christians use it, for clarity of the Old Testament or Torah, the Jewish Bible, it's here we can get the clarity of first fruits. 
So I'll reference uh, some items from that. You think of the Talmud of the Torah kind of like, if you will, as a concordance for the Bible. And what's a concordance for the Bible? A concordance is a reference tool to help study the Bible. It lists biblical words alphabetically with indications to enable the inquirer or the theology, a theology a student to find the passages of the Bible where the words occur. The Talmud can be used in a similar way to help reference the Old Testament. So it helps to understand Jewish traditions. Again, this is why we, when we're studying the Bible, we, we hear the phrase, as in Jewish traditions. It is through the Talmud we understand the amount or value of the first fruits to be offered. Now we learn about first fruits described in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse one through 11. It's also in Leviticus. But in, uh, I'm gonna read that later. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna let you know that the basic understanding of first fruits you, you can get from uh, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse one through 11. And I'll read that later. In the Talmud, first fruits is also explained in detail in the Bikram. Remember we talked about Bikram. It's in the Bikram tractate of the Talmud. What's a tractate? It's kind of like a chapter or a section. So in Bikram 3.2, we learn about first fruits. Now, according to the Teramoth tractate, that's a different section, the Teramoth tractate of the Talmud in Teramoth 4.3, a 60th part of the annual yield is in a prepared form was the minimum about amount that could be offered. So what, is the, what do we mean by a 60th? One over 60, so that fraction, multiply it by 365 days, that equates to just a little over six days. So what we're learning from Jewish tradition as documented in Talmud is that the first fruit offering is the equivalent of a harvest of a bountiful harvest of one sixtieth, which is about a week. So this is why the Resurrection Center simplifies the understanding of first fruits being a financial value of one week's salary. So you hear this based on Jewish tradition. So what do we mean by one week salary? Maybe you get paid twice a week or once a week or once a month. If you get paid once a week, well, then you know what it is. If you get paid every two weeks, then cut that in half because that's a value of one week. If you get paid once per month, well then, um, you, what you do is you take a look at um, that amount and divide it by four to get the one week. If you're like me, uh, a business owner, and it's feast or famine, what you do is you look at your previous tax return and look at the income that you had for the previous year and take, uh, divide that by 52. So you, you get um, a certain amount of money and let's say it's 52,000. I'll use a simple amount, 52,000. And you divide that by 52. It's uh, what it is, it's 1,000. So that would, what the first fruit would be. You, you take that taxable income, divide it by 52 weeks to find out what the value of one week is. So that's what it is. So it's your annual income divided by 52 weeks. It's 25% or one fourth of your monthly salary. It's 50% or one half of the salary you get if you get paid every two weeks. So that's how we know uh, what, by Jewish tradition, what the value as instructed by uh, Jewish tradition, what the value of um, the first fruits is. Now, the book of Leviticus describes the ceremony. I'm, I'm gonna talk about the ceremony now. Uh, this third book of the Bible in the Old Testament was developed over a long period of time, reaching its present form during the Persian period between 538 to 332 BC. It takes place during the month or month and a half between the completion of the tabernacle, which is shown in Exodus, and the Israelites' departure from Sinai, uh, which is in Numbers. 
the instructions of the Leviticus emphasize ritual, legal, and moral practices rather than beliefs. Most of the chapters consist of God's speeches to Moses, which God commands Moses to repeat to the Israelites. Then in Leviticus, God tells the Israelites and the priests how to make offerings in the tabernacle and how to conduct themselves while camped around the Holy Tent Sanctuary. I will read Leviticus chapter 23, verse 9 through 14. Again, Leviticus chapter 23, uh, 9 through 14. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an epa of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord, for a sweet aroma and its drink offering shall be of wine one-fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain or nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout generations in all your dwellings. Now, here's the importance of first fruits. The meaning of first fruits first fruits is a religious offering of the first agricultural produce of the harvest. In classical Greek, Roman, and Hebrew religions, the first fruits were also given to priests as an offering to God. In Exodus 23 19, the scripture reads, The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. And in Numbers 8, 18, 13, the scripture reads, the first ripe fruits of all that is in their land, which they bring to the Lord shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. When we offer our first fruits, we attract divine increase and overflow. In Proverbs 3.10, the scripture states clearly that so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. In giving first fruits, you lay the foundation upon which your harvest will overflow. It is a prophetic blessing for your future. The first time we see a first fruit offering goes to the time of Cain and Abel, when both sons of Adam appeared before the Lord. The difference between their offerings is that Abel's offering was accepted because he was able to be obedient, and Cain's was rejected because he can't. it's something you can't do. Abel gives the first and the fat, while Cain gave an offering, not the first nor the best. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 2 through 7, the story is described in better detail. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will not be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master. Now we're going to talk about the meaning and understanding of first fruits. And there's four things that I'll talk about. The literal meaning the spiritual meaning, the Passover connection, and the prophetic meaning. Those are the four, literal, spiritual, Passover, and prophetic, okay? So let's take a look at number one, the literal meaning. First fruit refers to the first portion of the harvest, which is given to God. Most notably, the first fruits are the first to come in time, a pledge or hope of the greater harvest to follow, and especially a dedication to God. A first fruit ceremony is described in detail in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 through 11, which we'll talk about. Note that the firstborn, whether human or beast, was also considered as God's special possession and can be considered a type of first fruits. Exodus chapter 22, 29 says that, and Exodus 34, 19 says that. Now I'm going to read Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1 through 11. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1 through 11. When you have entered the land, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it. Take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil 
of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the priest in office at the time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean. And he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil to, to, that you, Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. Then you and the Levites and the foreigners residing among you shall rejoice in all things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for that word. Now I will talk about number two, the spiritual meaning. By giving God the first fruits, Israel acknowledged that all good things come from God and that everything belongs to God. Giving the first fruit was also a way of expressing trust in God's provision, just as he provided the first fruits. So he would provide the rest of the crops that were needed. Note that the Feast of First Fruits was instituted when the nation of Israel was still wandering without land or crops. It was observed in faith that God would lead the people to the land he had promised. So it was a prophetic offering. Um, now, number three, I'll talk about the Passover connection. Passover was not only the spring festival celebrated under the covenant for the Israelites, it also commemorated the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost. The Feast of First Fruits actually took place during the week long Passover celebration, and we know this in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4 through 8, on the first day after the Sabbath that occurred in the midst of the week. Pentecost occurred 50 days after the Sabbath and marked the culmination of what started at the Feast of First Fruits. As its name indicates, the Feast of First Fruits marked thanksgiving to God for the first fruits of the harvest, the finances. In this case, the grain and cereal harvested in the spring of ancient Palestine. At this festival, the Israelites offered the very first sheaf of the harvest and were not allowed to eat anything from the crop until they gave its initial portion to the Lord. And in Leviticus chapter 23, verse uh, says, you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute, statute forever throughout your generations. This required a great deal of faith on the part of the Israelites, as they would be giving the offering of first fruits at a time when not much was ready to be harvested. They had to trust God that he would indeed provide the fullness of grain that had yet to come forth. Something that uh, from a human perspective was far from certain given the people's utter dependence on the right amount of rainfall and so forth to give the best crop. So it was uh, an offering of faith. 50 days uh, after the Feast of first, first Fruits was the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost which was the grand celebration at the end of the grain harvest. On this occasion, the offerings of food and animals to the Lord were more lavish, as we find in Leviticus chapter 23, 15 through 22, an appropriate way to thank him for the tremendous bounty he had provided. Now let's go to number four, the prophetic meaning. Israel was described as the first fruits of God's harvest, and we know this in Jeremiah chapter two, verse three. Israel was to be a pledge of the greater harvest in as much as she would experience God's redemption and witness of this redemption to the nations that they too might come to know the God of Israel, our God. 
in addition to the fact that God has promised that we too will be raised from the dead, as we see in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says that as redeemed people, we possess the first fruits of the Spirit. So to review, we talked about the meaning and understanding of first fruits. We talked about the literal meaning, the spiritual meaning, the Passover connection, the prophetic meaning. That's all I wanted to say about the meaning and understanding of first fruits. Now let's talk about the five kinds of first fruits. Let's talk about that. The five kinds of first fruits. Number one, the first harvest. Number two, Israel. Number three, believers, Christians. Number four, the Holy Spirit. And number five, Jesus. Those are the five kinds of first fruits. Let's talk about number one, the first harvest. In the Old Testament, God commanded his people to give the first and best portions of the harvest as an offering to him. And that's in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16, and Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 35. By giving the first fruits as an offering to God, the Israelites acknowledged that all the harvest, in fact, everything they had came from God and belonged to him. The offering of first fruits was likewise an expression of faith that something else, the harvest, the rest of the crop, would come later. Therefore, the first fruits offering acknowledged God's ownership of everything, expressed thankfulness for his provision, and anticipated what was to come. Now let's go to number two, Israel. In a symbolic use of the term, Jeremiah called Israel the first fruits of God's harvest. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. And that's in Jeremiah 2, 3. Just as the first and choicest crops were devoted to God, Israel was God's chosen and set apart people. And number three, believers, us Christians. In Romans 16, 5, and 1 Corinthians 16, 50, the first converts of a particular area were called the first fruits. Some translations use the term first converts, but literally it's first fruits, as we see in the King James Version. The same word used in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 20. Okay? In James 1.18, uh, it uses the term with reference to believers. By his choice, we gave, uh, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The new birth we have experienced is only a preview of the day to come when he will make all things new in heaven and a new earth. Number four, the Holy Spirit. Paul said we have the Spirit as first fruits, as shown in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. The Holy Spirit is a foretaste, the first installment of our future glory. He is God's pledge of a more to come in our resurrection life. And number five, Jesus. When the Apostle Paul, I can't even say that right. When the Apostle Paul said Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, he was drawing an analogy between the Old Testament offering and Jesus' resurrection. As the Old Testament first fruits symbolized and consecrated the entire harvest that was to follow, Christ's resurrection was the foretaste of the resurrection of all believers yet to come. His resurrection is our assurance that one day all believers will be raised from the dead and will receive new resurrected bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, where death is your victory, where death is your sting. So what we've talked about is the five kinds of first fruits, the first harvest, Israel, believers, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. So that completes um, here on Resurrection, say, can't even say it, resurrectioncenterradio.com, part three of first fruits. We had uh, two other parts. We first talked about the theology of first fruits, which is the academic study of first fruits. Today, we answered some questions that came out of that discussion. And we also discussed more of the divinity of first fruits, the spiritual aspect of first fruits, what God has called us to be. Um, I thank you for joining me. I head up the Bravehearted Ministry. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.